found the regressing disciples and welcomed them back. He made breakfast for them on the shore after they'd been out fishing all night. We had the deja vu event of the miraculous catch of fish. But tonight we're going to do what John does in his gospel so well, and that's focus on the individual. We've seen throughout the gospel, even when we looked at the resurrection, the individual responses to the resurrection. And in many of the chapters in John, we find Jesus interacting with individuals, the woman at the well, as an example. In tonight's lesson, we're going to see Jesus as he restores not just only the seven who are there fishing that day, that night, but also the individual one. As he turns his attention from the seven and offers this tender restoration to Peter, the individual and the one. I'm so thankful that John does this in his gospel. Because it lets me know and it lets all of us know that Jesus not only just sees us as the church, but he sees us as individual people in the church. And that Jesus knows us as a group, but he also knows me as a person. That he not only loves his church, but he loves me. So turn to John chapter 21 and let's continue in our study. And now we'll see Jesus as he restores Peter, beginning in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, the son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old... You will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Simon Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, a rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. Only he said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? And this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have, would not have room for the books that would be written. Jesus turns and says, do you love me more than these? Who did he mean? What did he mean by these? Well, there are three ideas or possibilities, I suppose. Was Jesus saying, do you love me more than these fish, than this fishing industry? Do you love me more than your occupation? Or was he saying, do you love me more than these as do you love me more than you love these other disciples? Or was he saying, do you love me more than these as, do you love me more than the other disciples love me? Do you love me more than they do? Peter is hurt that Jesus feels it is necessary to ask three times. 
but it is Jesus' way of pointing out three things. We may go wrong as Peter did, but we can be forgiven. We may have other occupations, but our Christian ideals, occupations, need to be the strongest in our lives. And the Christian message is essentially one of doing things. It is of action, it is of acting, it is of feeding and taking care. Now, of these three ideas of what, it, what are these referring to, I'm going to focus on this possibility. Do you love me more than your own life? Now, it could be the other two as well. It could be, do you love me more than these other disciples do? But I would like you to consider that one of the possibilities is that Jesus is looking and, and here is the, the, the catch of fish and the fishing boats and the nets that are all there. And he looks and he sweeps his hand across and says, do you love me more than these things? The disciples have regressed back into the habits of their lives, their old lives. Jesus gently brings them into a consideration of where their deepest love lies. Do you love me more than these things? Who do you love the most? What do you love the most? What in your life is going to be the focus of your life from this point forward, Peter? William Barclay says it may be that Jesus swept his hand round the boat and its net and equipment and the catch of fish and said to Peter, Simon, do you love me more than these things? And are you prepared to give them all up? No one can serve two masters, Jesus had taught them in Matthew 6. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus is about to return to the Father. He's there to restore Peter. And as he turns his attention right to Peter, he wants him to consider what is going to be the greatest love of his life. Is it going to be your job? Or is it going to be me? Is it going to be things? Or is it going to be me? This decision involves sacrifice. Fishing was Peter's livelihood. Will he give up his career for Jesus? It would be a statement and a fight of materialism, which is a great, uh, a great challenge for us in our age as well. An unhealthy focus on things. Is Jesus challenging Peter to give up a pursuit of wealth and materialism? It would involve a redefinition of success. How is your life going to be measured as successful, Peter? A redefinition of wealth. Will you measure wealth according to the things you possess? Or the amount of love that you have for me? It would be a redefinition of happiness. What brings happiness in life? Things or me? Earlier, Mark records that Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Saint Peter. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last. And the last first. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. And he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Do you love me more than your old life and are you willing to give it up for me? Now, I can hardly get through that point because I'm so excited about the next one. It's this one, the three for three. My eyes have been opened 
in this study, in this point, more than any other that I've ever studied this, I was so excited about it, I couldn't wait to get to it, so here it is. The third time that he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. It is no accident that Jesus gives Peter three opportunities to own him as a counterweight to the three disownings. <clears throat> Jesus is merciful. Jesus wants wayward disciples to be restored. <laughs> It's the, it's the view of God that we need to have. It's the one that's the healthy view of Jesus. That Jesus wants men to succeed in their faith. That He wants people to be restored. That He desires for people to come back. That He's longing for the return of wayward people. And three times... Jesus allows Peter to express his love in front of the other disciples when he had just only days before denied him. Now he has the opportunity to own him. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. Now I almost didn't include this next section, but it's my favorite part of the lesson. And it's the one on the words for love that are used in the interchange. I don't want you to lose this first point, though, and that is that there's three for three. It's an opportunity for Peter to express his love. But this is the way the conversation actually happens in the conversation between and the interaction between Jesus and Peter. Two different words for love are used. This is not the, the ex most exciting part, but it is leading up to it. Jesus asks him, do you agape me? That's the question he asked. You know, that's the, the ultimate self-sacrificing, unconditional love. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, Peter replies. It's the word phileo. It's the, the word which we get the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. Brotherly love. So it's almost, but not quite, as if Jesus says, do you really love me? And Peter replies, yes, you know that I'm your good friend. You know I'm your buddy. And, and Jesus says, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, you know that I am your friend, that I am close to you, that we're close. And then Jesus says, are you close to me? Do you phileo me? Do you love me? And Peter says, you know all things, Lord. You know that I am your friend, that I'm, I, I'm your buddy. Now, this was such a disappointment to me in the way this, this played out because it seemed as if Peter never got to where Jesus wanted him to be. And I, I didn't want it to end like that. And so I wanted it to be that, that Jesus says, uh, do you agape me? And Peter says, I'm your friend. Uh, Jesus says, do you agape me? And Peter says, I'm your friend. And then Jesus says, okay, are you my friend? And Peter says, I agape you. That would have been great. You know, that would have been this wonderful ending and you would have could turned John clothes and been all excited about it. But it's not the way it happens. It's, it's almost as if, if I didn't want to include it in the lesson because it just doesn't end the way I wanted it to turn out. It's as if Peter kind of blew it again. That he just didn't quite come to where he needed to be. But this next slide expresses to you what is the most exciting part of this lesson for me. The fact that Peter, in the conversation, never raises his love to the level of unconditional love teaches us at least two things. First, Jesus once again is willing to reach down to where Peter is and pull him up to a greater love. He's just not going to give up on Peter. He's going to keep working on him. And when Peter's just not quite ready to say, I unconditionally love you, Jesus still doesn't give up on him. The number two, which is my favorite. That Jesus' indication of the way that Peter will eventually die points to the fact that Peter will indeed one day love Jesus with agape. Now that to me is the best part of the lesson. 
I kept thinking, why at the end does Peter or does Jesus tell Peter how he's going to die? Why does it is it just some fact that's thrown at the end of the book, or is there some reason that Jesus immediately says, "Here's how you're going to die for me, Peter." I believe now it's because of the the interplay of the words love. Peter never quite gets there, and Jesus says to him, "But you will." Because one day you are going to die for me. And that is a God. And that's the kind of ending I wanted. The hero of this interaction is therefore Jesus and not Peter. It is Jesus who finds Peter where he is and gently lifts him up to greater things which eventually ends in Peter truly understanding and showing unconditional love when he dies for Jesus. What a great ending to the book. One last thought. Peter's refusal to use the deepest expression of love may have given us insight into the guilt that he had for denying Jesus. His action of denial had proven that his love was limited to just something less than agape. And maybe he just can't quite say, I've proven to you, Jesus, that I love you unconditionally. And he's just so filled with embarrassment over what happened. Jesus says, do you agape me? I say, well, I've kind of proven to you, Jesus, that I'm just your friend. And maybe that's the reason that he just couldn't quite admit to that depth of love because he didn't feel like that he had shown that yet. But he would. Isn't that great? That's my favorite part. Okay, number three. Hope for all who hurt Jesus. Maybe that's why we like, I like Peter so much. Is there so much of myself that is reflected by Peter. And witnessing Peter's failings and restoration gives hope to all disciples who fail. Remember, Jesus wants us to be restored. He takes the initiative. He is the hero. He's the one who reaches down to where we are and pulls us up to where he is. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And they said to him, follow me. Peter's going to glorify Jesus. That gives me hope. Jesus still wanted Peter despite his failings. Jesus still wanted Peter despite his personal weakness. This gives me hope. And I hope you will indulge me in something. I've done this once before in this series of lessons. When Zachary was taking a class at my son Zachary at, at Harding, they watched part of the Gospel of John, which is just a, a dramatization of the Scripture. And I th thought it, we would watch this, this section of Jesus appearing to his disciples here in this occasion to kind of give us a dramatization of what it might have been like. Uh, also, uh, Daniel told me that their, their group watched this Gospel of John and also the Passion of the Christ before going to the Holy Land this week. So it would be a great way to kind of set that up for them. Um, and Daniel is, is in Jerusalem today. So that's what's bringing me. Okay, let's watch that if you have it set up for us. It's just about 10 minutes, I think, or 8 minutes. Scars of the nails in his head. And put my finger on those scars. 
and my hand in his side. I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were together again indoors, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Put your finger here and look at my hands. And reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. My Lord. Oh my God. You believe because you see me. How happy are those who believe without seeing me? In his disciples' presence, Jesus performed many other miracles which are not written down in this book. But these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have life. After this, Jesus appeared once more to his disciples at Lake Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel, the one from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples of Jesus were all together. Simon Peter said to the other, I'm going fishing. We will come with you, they told him. So they went out in a boat, but all that night they did not catch a thing. As the sun was rising, Jesus stood at the water's edge, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Young men, haven't you caught anything? Not a thing! Throw your net out on the right side of the boat, and you will catch some! So they threw the net out. Jesus loved and said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Peter heard that it was the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken his clothes off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples came to shore in the boat, pulling the net full of fish. They were not very far from land, about a hundred yards away. When they stepped to shore, they saw a charcoal fire there fish on it and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net ashore full of big fish, 153 in all. Even though there were so many, still the net did not tear. Come and eat. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. So Jesus went over, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This then was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples, after he was raised from death. After they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. Do you love me more than these others do? Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Take care of my lambs. A second time, Jesus said to him, Son, son of John, do you love me?
take care of my sheep. A third time, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter became sad because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And so he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. telling you the truth. When you were young, you used to get ready and go anywhere you wanted to. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you up and take you where you don't want to go. In saying this, Jesus was indicating the way in which Peter would die and bring glory to God. Then Jesus said to him, Follow me. Peter turned around and saw behind him that other disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who had leaned close to Jesus at the meal and had asked, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about this man? I want him to live until I come. What is that to you? I hope you enjoyed that. It kind of uh, brings the emotion to it, that interaction between um, Peter and Jesus. Hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Finally tonight, I want to speak just about the idea of single-mindedness. Jesus tells Peter, feed my lambs, Verse 15, take care of my sheep. Verse 16, feed my sheep. Verse 17, perhaps the best way to overcome despair is to get back to work. Perhaps the best way to overcome despair is to do the actions and feelings. The feelings will come. Jesus gives Peter something to do. He gives him a work. He tells him to take care of and feed his people. And Peter does. Jesus tells Peter to be single-minded. Whatever he has in store for other people, in this case John, it makes no difference to one's own task and commitments. Um, it's interesting that Peter turns and says, well, what about John? And Jesus says, I'm interested in you. I'm focused on you. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And in verse 19, he says, follow me. And in verse 22, he says, follow me. It's as if Jesus says to him, I believe in you enough to look past your failings and set you on a lifelong path of following so I, I suppose the answer for us then is when we reach a point of restoration and being restored, will we be burdened and shackled by the mistakes of our past? Or will we believe in the forgiveness of Jesus and get to work? Peter will indeed feed Jesus' lambs he will become a pillar in the church, a stalwart. Today's lessons then, brothers and sisters, have been about restoration. Jesus desires my restoration and he desires yours. 
He comes to where we have regressed and offers us an opportunity for a fresh start, a new beginning. He does this for us as a people, as a group, but He does it for us as individuals, as ones, as a person. He does it for you. Will we say yes? Now, tonight's lesson concludes our study of John's Gospel. May these words sink deeply into our hearts and culminate into the kind of love that Jesus asked of Peter. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Just bow for a prayer. Father, we are thankful that Jesus desires to restore us when we are wayward, when we fall, when we do what is wrong, when we wander off, that Jesus finds us where we are, He loves us, He lifts us up to a better place, He sets us on a new path, He gives us a second chance, He wraps His arms around us, He expresses His great and undying love for us. And I pray, Lord, that you will be with us that in response to this great love that Jesus offers, that we will grow from I phileo him to I agape him. Thank you for this book that your servant John has written. It has inspired us to love you even more, to cherish your son, and to be thankful for your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand with an invitation song if you'd like to respond to it.